right. Welcome to the first, the first version, first episode of um, working with Dev Container. So I've been spending a lot of time on Dev Container uh, at Daytona, and actually I think it's container.dev. So containers.dev. Let's bring this over here. Containers.dev. All right. So. This is the dev container spec, and um, this is what we'll be working on. So one of the things that I noticed was working this, the docs are a little light uh, as to what's happening. You have to you have to play around with it a lot. You have to get used to using the logs. Um, and not everything is as documented as would make it easy enough to use and it's all it's all a bunch of bash in the end which coming from sort of like uh, the chef and puppet days is is a little bit frustrating and sad but we're going to write some yeah i can as somebody who's written bash for a very very long time i can i can now tell you uh, as long as you are at least reasonable at writing bash you will probably have career you will have a career in devops because very clearly it's never going away like bash scripting will, will always be there so one of the things i noticed was there's a lot of um there's just a lot of repeated actions that you want to do um you want to install a package you want to go get a tarball all of those sort of basically all the things that you would wish you had a, f a framework like puppet or chef to take care of for you you're kind of on your own and there are there are some amount of uh, if we go look at the uh let's see if we go look at the if we go look at the spec we go look at issues i think there are some um no that's not it where is it proposals there are some proposals in here that would make some of this easier so um there's like a library uh feature that that folks are talking about that would make this a little bit easier um to be able to include because what you'll see is that we're basically going to copy into every single dev container uh, a script and it's going to be a bash script it's going to just be a big pile of bash and it's going to be on us to keep that clean so um i'm going to draw what i think we need to build and i'm going to use uh what's it called x excella draw to do this um ooh, look i was doing something before this Interesting. Well, we can get rid of this. All right. So, what is what do we need to build? So, w one thing that I noticed is that um, let me show you what I what I've been building. So, I've been building Dev Container features, and Dev Container features. Um, you get this directory. You. You have source, and then within this, you have the different features that you're going to build. So I've built three so far. Uh, one for a tune, which is a, a way to basically um, share and record uh, shell history. Uh, Dagger is a CI tool, a direct acyclic graph CI tool that just lets you manage builds and things. And Doppler is a secret manager. So a tune is probably the most, <laughs> probably the most complicated thing that I've worked on. Um, and if we go look at this, um, you know, you have a little bit of JSON which describes, you know, what your thing is. If you take any variables, in this case, um, installing um, various features. Actually, you know what? Um, while we're just sitting here. I'm just going to turn on a little bit of stream safe music because 
talking to myself is in the background is um it's a little it's a little quiet so i'm gonna put some noise i'm gonna go through this into my headphones and you should hear it as well uh feel free to chat if you can't hear something um and i'll try to keep the sound low so that it doesn't bug you over my voice put this down to 30 there we go just enough to have a little background noise. So um, you can take uh, variables in here, and then these are the you know, additional additional ways to make changes. So, oh, oh. all right, uh, the CEO of Daytona just joined. Thanks a lot, Ivan. Probably one of the few people watching the stream right now, but awesome. Um, uh let's let's dive into this post create the install and the post create and we'll talk about some of the challenges and why this is why this is proving to be difficult and we need we need some helpers so if we go look at this install script it's not all that long except that this is actually just one of many scripts and so you'll see that a lot of this stuff is real boilerplate. So in this case, um, make sure that we, there's some managing of um, app get to make sure the, that we've got, um... hi, Gogi, welcome. Um, to make sure that we have what we need, right? Uh, so these, you know, in my other two features, I basically have to co copy and paste all of this. And so all I want to do is to app get install some files. And in order to do that, it, you know, it's bash. So it's on me to figure that out. And, you know, we're trying to do things the right way, the safe way. And the other thing that's really important to know about dev container is it has to be idempotent, which means that when you run it once, it's going to go through. And then that script's going to get run over and over again, potentially in the same container. So let's say that you've got a dev container and that environment, you launch it the first time and then you rebuild it. You, you, know, you, you go and you, you hit the rebuild because you made a, a change to the, the uh, dev container to you know jump a number or something, to bounce a number. It's going to run the script again which means that if this script fails the second time you run it because it's already installed, then it's going to break. And so you have this script has to be able to run like a thousand times in a row with no, if it, if it doesn't need to make changes, then it just needs to just sit there and be quiet, which is really familiar to those of us who are coming from the sort of the infrastructure as code, chef, puppet, Terraform. Um, but in bash, there's a lot of requirements that are on you um, to deal with that, which is often why people pick tools like Chef and Puppets so that they don't have to do this. Um, but in this case, we're going to use these two scripts just to install curl and the CA so that we can make sure that HTTPS works. And then we're going to go install Attune. And this script is the install script from Attune app, but I didn't want to curl out to it because I didn't think that that was the world's safest thing. So I downloaded a copy, a clean copy that I knew was safe and that I went through and chat text tested. And so then I, I put this in here, but now that's on me to make sure that this is updated and, and that, you know, if a tune changes their install that I basically pay attention to that. Um, let's go back to install. Um, so we're going to install that. Once we have the actual binary installed, we'll do some configuration. Right. So in this case, I'm going to make a local shared directory so I can just put a bunch of scripts in there. Uh, I'm going to put these three scripts in there and then make sure that they're uh, executable. And so um, if completion true, then we're actually going to go also install the, the shell completions. Um, we use the tool for that. Um, and also that we tell the setup shell, hey, by the way, um, <clears throat> we're expecting you to, to, 
to do this as well. This is a weird behavior because I want to change the the way the script works based on these um, based on these variables, but I don't know that I have access in the various lifecycle scripts to all of the pieces yet. So one thing that we'll be figuring out is where do we have access? Um, this is something that we'll talk a lot about in a minute, but all of these scripts run as root. Um, and this dev container that I'm using does not. It runs as VS Code. And so one of the challenges is, is all these scripts run as root, and the user that I want to do a lot of work with, especially in the later stages, uh, you have to you have to manage that. So we're going to keep going through this. Um, at the very bottom, we're going to clean up. So all of this is a Docker. One of the complications is all of this is done inside of Docker, which means you can blow up these these layers. You can make them huge um, if you keep around. Um, say the app lists and whatnot, the more that you install into this container layer, you know, you're going to push it to a repo and then you're going to have to build it. And so you're going to want this to be fast. The faster you can make it means the smaller layer you probably need. Um, there are, there are people who are also in this community that are working on it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so let's just go look at this setup. So if we go back to what's happening here in this dev container feature, um, the post create command happens when the, so the feature gets installed, that is happening. Once that container is built, then it will, um, it'll run post create. And so we'll talk a little bit about life cycles, but just to walk through why this gets complicated. Now let's go look at the uh, setup, a tune script. So here's another example of a function that you need that's on you to make. I just want to make sure that there's a file and a string, or sorry, a string and a file. So in this case, I want to make sure that the sync, the sync frequency for a tunes config is five minutes. By default, it's an hour. And in a sort of disposable environment, that might be a long time and you might lose, you might lose some of your history. So I want to take that to five minutes. But again, because of item potency, this script's going to get run at least once and potentially many times during the course of a uh, can of a workspace's life cycle. And so if you just append this to the back of the string, it will break on it'll actually break a tune on further runs because a tune, if it has multiple of these in its config file, will error out and say like, ah, there's too many of these things. So then it's on you to make sure that you only put it in once. Now, in tools like Chef and Puppet, that's just built into the, you know, file, the file uh, type. Um, but in Bash, it's on you to go write a, write a shell script to do it. Um, so, uh, you'll also notice that I exit zero here as opposed to exit one, partly because if you exit one, you're telling the script, uh, you're telling code spaces that something went wrong, or you're telling dev container that something went wrong, and it will error out here. In this case, if you haven't set these environment variables, that's not an error. I just don't want you to try, I just don't want to do the automation to go do the login. So again, this is one of those things where you just have to understand all of the different pieces of dev container and how it runs and it runs as a bunch of scripts and scripts call other scripts and then there's scripts in a life cycle. Um, and it just, it, it gets to be really complicated. And then um, the, the last bit is the uh, setup for the shell. Um, this directory, this, this script is run as root. And unfortunately, you know, we might not want to be messing with roots bash RC. We want to run with the end users. And so one of the things that's hard is it's hard, at least I haven't found a good way to know in these various scripts. You, you know who's running it. You know who the user is, but 
you have to you have to figure that out to go into like this. And so this is where into this bash RC. So this is where you know in the beginning you'll see during the install we figure out the remote user home. And so remote, this is one of the environment variables that dev container sets for us. And so then we tell the startup shell to use that directory to call this script with that directory at the end of this. The reason that it's not there is because we don't always, we don't always do it if we're not turning on auto completion. And so this is probably not the world's greatest way of doing this, but it's the way that I've figured out so far. So back to the drawing, what, what do we want to do? So we're going to start with a, a dev container. So um, this is a dev container. Uh, there's a couple things that we're going to know about this dev container. So it's going to have a user which might be root, it might be VS code. It's actually something that the uh, the end user can set and there's uh, dev container features that can help change this. So going into dev container and going into a dev container feature, you don't know and you can't make assumptions about that. Uh, the other thing that could be in here is an arc. So, uh, these images are running as containers, which means that they have architectures associated with them. Um, if I run this on my Mac, it's going to have an ARM architecture. If I run it in Daytona on a server, it's going to have x86. I'm currently sitting on a Windows box uh, running Docker, so it's going to have x86. So those things can change. And it's also going to have an operating system. Um, come on now. So we're going to do operating system. Take that guy out. All right. Arc. So we've got a dev container. That dev container is going to have an architecture. It's going to have a user and it's going to have an operating system. So the, you know, the most common are going to be um, a Debian flavor, Debian Ubuntu or Alpine Linux. But what that means is you need to know there's there's, there's certainly a packager difference. So in one, you're going to use apt. In the other, you're going to use APK. But there might also be like packaging differences. So the name might be different between the two different operating systems or what you need might be different. And so you're going to have to handle that. And then the user is going to either be root or something that the, the user sets. And you're going to have to handle that. So in order to do this, You'll need, a, you'll need a way to understand what architecture do you want to run on. And maybe you don't have to do this. Maybe for your environment, when you're making a dev, uh, a dev container or a dev feature, you can make certain assumptions. Like nobody has Max. Everybody has x86. We'll never do ARM. Um, if you're going to open source that, it'll start to change. But right now, we're going to assume that we have to, hand, at least for the purpose of these helpers, that we... Partly what we want to do is, is deal with some of this complexity. Um, then you're going to have one or more. Uh, we're going to change the background for this. Uh, you're going to have one or more dev container features. And those features actually have these same these same bits so we need to be able to handle
Let's see. We're going to send this backwards. We're going to send this. We're going to send, oh. gonna send this to the back. And then can we change the opacity of these? It doesn't matter if we can't, but it just looks better if it has a more solid background. We'll just let that sit for now. I'll fix it later. But you can have lots of features. Um, and let's go look at what some of these features might be. So this is actually probably my favorite feature within Dev Container is that you can just add features on top. So what you can think about dev container if you if you have an image that maybe is your production image this is what's going to go out to production you can start with that and that doesn't have all the developer tools that you might need but you can use features when developers attach to that to bring in what they want so in this case you know in your production image you probably don't want the aws cli um but you can just use a feature to bring it in. And then within the AWS CLI, there's, uh, you, know, you can have all of the usuals. So you can um, have a version string. Also, if you have VS Code customizations that you want to use for that feature, you can do that. So in this case, it's going to go ahead and bring in some VS Code extensions. So if you pull in the feature, you can pull in the corresponding extension to go with that feature. Um, basically, anything that you want to do to configure the environment that, that this, this feature runs in, you can do that. So you can run scripts. You can configure uh, the VS Code environment, um, which makes it really powerful. And on the downside, though, is unfortunately, these all are basically just more bash scripts um so if we go dig into any of these um so like the github cli this is great great to have and in the end this is weird i've been getting this a lot from from github recently but if we hit really do it again we'll get it you'll notice you know, if you go through, if you ever want to see just a ton of bash, just go look at uh, GitHub features because, or sorry, dev packages features, because they've got just tremendous amounts of bash. This is a multi-hundred line bash script that is bespoke and written just to install the GitHub CLI. And if I wanted to do this for one of my... I would basically likely just copy and paste this and start from scratch. And so what we want to do is avoid exactly that. We want to get a library that we can pull in um, and, and be able to basically not do this. But you will see in here, you will see things like, um, so here it's getting the GPG key. Uh, I don't know if this one does any architecture work but it's definitely handling some versions um it does do architecture work uh right here so it uses uh it uses dpackage which means that this only this this particular one only works for a uh, ubuntu and debian flavored distros if you try to use this with a uh, alpine linux it won't it's up to you you know whether or not you want to try to support both for me the goal will be that and maybe that'll just be too hard right now we are going to start ubuntu and debian and then my hope is that we'll be able to support both but yeah you know, basically at some point you're you're basically rewriting uh Puppet and Chef.
to, to do all this. So, all right. So you're going to have one or more features. And um, at the end of it, I think these these three things are the most important most important part is that there are life cycles. Let's go ahead and, and run through the, the life cycle of a dev container. So does it actually have, I don't think it does. Let's see, here we go, stages. Um, well, this is what it's trying to do. So the inner loop is, um, and I can tell this is a little bit, let's just go ahead and uh, open this image in a new tab. Let's see, there we go. So you've got your inner loop, which is what the the developer works on. So your developer, you work on a feature, you test it, it fails, you do it again. That process going through that cycle, that's the inner loop. Then you commit that, send it up to GitHub, and then the outer loop kicks in. Outer loop is basically CI and all the other things that happen before the app goes to production. So what the dev container is trying to show here, what they want to do is and this is what we were talking about in the beginning. The OS, which in for all of these things is a Docker container, which basically means a package manager. Um, because you actually, for Docker, you don't need an operating system. The operating system comes from the underlying runtime. But when most people talk about operating systems with Docker, they mean, uh, they, they use that to shortcut to mean a package manager. Uh, the runtimes and the libraries to go with that then the compilers, the build tools, you'll need both of those, but you only need those for the outer loop. And then debuggers, you don't need debuggers in the outer loop. And you don't need personalization and the productivity tools in the outer loop. So, you know, my customized bash scripts are not required in, in the outer loop and probably actually shouldn't be there. And the source code belongs to both. Um, and then the compiled application, the thing that actually gets deployed uh, should share the the base image. And so this is, you know, I've been working, I worked at Docker for six years, uh, starting in like 14, 2014. Um, it's very familiar. I, I worked with a lot of the Microsoft folks, um, including the folks that were building out Dev Container um, back when Docker and Docker Compose were getting added in, or Docker Compose was getting added into Dev Container. Um, and so this part all makes a lot of sense. The trick is, is just the complexity around doing all of this in bash. So let's go back to the docs. Um, and let's go to the reference. And we're going to go to life cycles. So this is the life cycle scripts. So we're going to keep track of these. So we're going to go to Galadraw. I'm going to go move all of you guys over here. This is the other thing that we're going to be dealing with is these life cycles. So well, right now we're just going to make that clear. This is the initialize command. Copy this. The initialize command flows to the on create. So this happens before the container is created, initialize. Um, so basically, if you want to set up some amount of the config, or if you need to set variables or other things before the whole thing kicks off. That's the phase you're going to use. I haven't used that yet, but I'm sure there's lots of reasons why you might want to. 
Um, on create is the is let's see is the first of three along with update and post create that finalize the container when the container is set up. It in it executes inside immediately after the container starts. So initialize happens before they create the container. Then on create happens, the container becomes, or sorry, before on create, the container is actually created. Then on create, the very first thing that happens is the on create command. So let's go ahead and put that in here. We're also gonna draw this line which we're going to call container creation. All right. So the initialize happens before container is created. Then the container is created. Then on create happens. Then update content happens. Uh, this executes whenever new content is available in the source tree during the creation process. So basically, I guess whenever, if you do a like git pull, um, this will run again. So this will run every time the, the source updates. So let's put this in. Oh, nope, I don't want to do that. Go back, update content. Okay. Update content command. So we're going to show this as a Let's see how we're going to do this. We'll draw a little thing. This is the So when the git source updates it's going to kick the update content command so these don't call each other but in terms of their life cycle this is the order in which they happen so maybe i won't put this in here i'll i'll show i won't put these in here i'll show that they are um, they are happening sequentially, but they are not, they actually don't call each other. So then the next thing that happens is the post create command. Post create. So once the dev container has been assigned to a user for the first time. So sometimes I'm you know like code spaces or other tools could probably build a bunch of these things and keep them sort of ready to assign to a user in the up like having gone through update command but just not given it out yet. And so post create means once a user gets assigned to it then this will run right before the user actually starts it gets attached to it um so post create post attach all right so so one of the things i don't understand is does where does start happen my Uh, post start. 
go in here. So post start command. I don't I don't know where this goes. I think we're gonna copy this, put this here. And we're gonna say user assigned. My I, I just actually, I don't know where this happens. Um, it happens after the container started, but it's it's unclear to me where that is. Um, this last one, though, is pretty, pretty simple. It's the one that I've been using the most. It's called post attach. So we go here. All right, post attach. Um, that's when the user actually joins the session. So I've been using this for um, when a uh, when I want to start the when I want to start the service that the you know so if it's like a Python Flask app, once the once this user attaches, go ahead and run the service because before that it doesn't make sense. But once this user starts, then go ahead on create um, or maybe up after update, uh, probably after update content, run pip install. That'd be a good time to do it. Um, every time that the source chain source tree changes, run pip install for update content, and then uh, post attach when the user joins. Go ahead and start the the service, um, and then I think that's it for the life cycle. Um, yeah, and this is also an important piece. If any of the life cycles script fails. It's going to bail out and it's not going to do any other scripts. So if you have uh, not an error, but if you if you want to basically stop processing a script, you need to make sure that that script returns zero, which is why like in those those couple examples, I exit zero, even though like an environment variable wasn't set because my intent was that's not breaking the script, but I don't want to do anything after this because anything after this requires that to happen. So make sure that you are really paying attention to your error codes. Um, so if you do something and it's going to exit, it's going to exit one because a directory is not there and that's not a problem for you, then make sure that you do something like or true to, to or, or do that in a function and don't let that uh, exit zero propagate because that will that or exit one that will cause you problems. All right. So that's the life cycle that we want to do. So these are the two things that we want to manage. We want to manage the architecture, the OS, and managing the user, the fact that the user changes. And we want to we want to deal with the fact that these things have these lifecycle scripts, which compared to other tools are fantastic. I actually love that I can I can pin into various stages of the life cycle and cause things to happen. I also like that these will get rerun. And let's show an example of that because I think it, it might just be sort of mind numbing to think about what that would look like. So I'm going to go to a simple flask example that I've got. So this is a, a very simple Python Flask application. If we go look at the application itself, <coughs> we'll see basically all it does is return hello world and tell you the Daytona information about where this is running. So Daytona is, in my mind, the best place to run a dev container workload. Uh, we can run that wherever. I've got an example cluster here we'll show. And so we're going to launch this. 
and we'll hit one button. And we're going to go ahead and fire this up. So I'm going to sign in with my GitHub account. What's happening here in the background is that we're launching Dev Container and we are creating a Linux environment with everything I need to be able to develop in in that Python Flask app. Um, it's going to go ahead and run. This takes about. I mean, it depends on it depends on the different dev containers. This is this is my uh, demo cluster, so it's definitely underpowered in terms of the hardware it's running. And so, for me, it takes a little bit longer than uh, it might for somebody that actually runs this on a on a larger instance. Um, but the goal here is that. In, in, instead of me having to maintain my developer environment, keep everything running, I will just have, um, and, and so you see the dev container happening now. It's basically doing the Docker, it's doing a Docker build of the dev environment and all the things that go with it. Uh, I don't think that I have a feature on this, but I can show how features work as well. Um, in the end, I don't have to install anything on my local laptop. I can put VS Code there if I'd rather use like a local version of VS Code rather than a browser version. I'll probably use the browser version just because it's easiest, but it'll work. It'll work with like local VS Code or JetBrains. Um, you'll notice here that was the this was the um, pip install, and so it's now getting the IDE set up for me. And uh, once that's going, then we'll have more or less everything we need to develop that Python Flask application. And all of this is happening inside the dev container specification, which I think is really nice. It's a clean and easy way that you can launch this in, you can launch this in Daytona, but you can also just run it in VS Code locally, or you can run it in other solutions. Like if you wanted to say, run it in code spaces, you could do that too. So here's, it's up and running. Um, and this is the live preview. So all of that was specified inside of this dev container. Um, so here's the, here's the dev container that I used. Um, I built a special one just to show how that would work, but there's, sort of out of the box dev containers that are easier to use. Um, I set up a bunch of uh, VS Code settings to make sure that it would pick up on the Python that I installed and uh, making sure that I install some extensions. And then if it sees port 5000, go ahead and open that preview. And I use the post create command to do the pip install. But I think it might be smarter This happens after update content, and once it's been assigned, it will ask you at least once, but cloud services will periodically update the command to refresh the cache. Um, well, let's just say that I want to do this in the update content command instead. So I'm going to go back to my Daytona, and I'm going to say, okay, instead of po post create, do that in the update content. And so you'll notice down here, uh, it offered to do a rebuild. And so the best part in my mind of um, what this looks like is instead of having to like get push this to a branch and then shut it down and then open up yet another uh, environment, ephemeral environment, I can just say, rebuild my current environment in place. And uh, trust me when I say that this isn't the case in a lot of other solutions. You would actually have to just basically tear everything down and push the rock back up the hill. Um, so what you see is we're going to go ahead and kick off that same build. Now, some of this, though, is already cached because this is a Docker container and the cache is there. And so it actually goes much faster the second time. And we only changed one bit, which is where the, the uh, pip install happens. 
And so we should get this coming through relatively quickly. Now we're going to start up the IDE. And then I will basically have made that change. And so one of the cool things is, is that we could do that for anything. We could update the image. Um, so let's say that uh, your company rolls out a new base image and that's got everything you need and it's got a new Python, it's got a new whatever. You can just update that. And maybe you're going to do that as part of a git pull. You know, you're going to git pull, you're going to rebase on top. You'll The environment will notice that something happened. And then you can just go ahead and kick off yet another version of that. And you don't have to do anything. So you'll notice, like, this doesn't seem right until this is actually, it kept all of the state and it's just reloading it. And so now I am exactly back to where I was, but I made a big change. And so uh, everything is is up and running. And so I want to, this is, this is what I want to take advantage of. And I think most people want to take advantage of this. You won't have to, um, most people won't write dev container. Uh, you might have some DevOps people, probably the same people that write the Docker file for your team. They'll do it. Um, I just think it's, it's, it, it is complicated. If we go look at this again, like there's a lot of stuff that's happening in here. Um, make this bigger. Um, but You know, I think it we, we, it should definitely be easier, and it def it def one hundred percent frustrates me that this is all basically more bash scripts. So let's set all of that aside, and we're gonna go and create a new project. So I'm gonna to start with. I'm gonna put it in my environment. Um, I'm gonna go create a new repository. We're going to call it dev helper. It's like hamburger helper, but for developer. Um, we're going to say this is dev container helpers for, or no, we'll say helpers for dev container. template and feature authoring it's public we'll add a readme we'll add a git ignore just to have it there we'll put a license on it it's going to be apache uh, it's my personal my personal favorite for this and we'll go ahead and create that repository all right now we've got that um so we could go ahead and open this in Daytona or somewhere else. Um, yeah, this is in, we could open it in VS Co or in code spaces. Um, this is an extension that we've, we've got to go open it in Daytona. Um, I'm going to open it in Daytona. So let's see if I've got the VS code bits fixed i think i do we'll find out so it's going to set up a workspace now one of the interesting things about daytona is there's not a dev container in there but daytona doesn't need that to get started so it's actually going to launch um with just a it's called universal which is the microsoft universal dev container image and it's basically a kitchen sink image it's got everything in it it's got go and python and ruby and all kinds of other other stuff in there and it's it's massive it's like four gigs but um you don't need dev container to get started which is something that i like um so that the length of time that just happened was probably that image getting pulled onto a new environment node for me and now we're going to start the we did the clone and now we're going to start the ide because there's really nothing in there right there's a there's a git ignore and a readme so um there's nothing nothing in there um let's see i'm going to close this 
I'm going to go to Daytona. This is the dev helper that I just started. I'm going to see if I can open it in VS Code. So this is dev container. This is like our, uh, sorry, this is Daytona's workspace manager dashboard. And you can see all the different things that I've started. Um, you can pin them if you want them to stand around for a while. Um, I'm going to try to open this in VS Code and see if that works. I haven't tried that in a little while, but let's try it. Close. All right, so let's see. All right, says the SSH keys, big box. I'm just checking. It's saying I can fix this later, but let's switch to switch to my desktop so that you can see what's going on um i've got that let's try let's get my environment up Workspaces, SSH. Interesting. So I have a very unique SSH setup because I set up from YubiKey for most things. Um, interesting. Well, we will fix that later. But for now, what we're going to do is we're going to go to source. And this is local. Let me make this bigger for you all. Go back to what do we call this dev helper. Oops, not that dev helper. GitHub, Matcap C, dev helper. So we're going to own it. Now, this is my YubiKey asking me to SSH, which is why my SSH, I think, is messed up right now, is I use YubiKey for, for all of that. Um, let's go to Dev Helper, do code. All right. Now we're going to pop this. We'll make this bigger so that you all can see it. Perfect. Um, one of the things that we can do is we're going to use the dev container. So I'm going to add uh, dev container configuration files. I, uh, I'm not going to do an Alpine. I'm. This is just a. Well, so there's a bash one scripts, which includes the bash IDE. That might be a good one. Um, all of these are, this is made by community. So what I might want to do is I might want to go look at it so I can see what it's doing. So it's in the VS code. Um, it installs bash, bash IDE, and bash debug. 
it works for everything. It uses a base container for Debian. Um, we can go sort of dig into what it's doing here. Oh, so it's got the bash debugging already configured as part of VS Code. So this might be a useful one. Let's go look at the Docker file. So it definitely uses it uses Ubuntu or Debian, and it uses a base variant from Microsoft. So, all right. So we could say, I suppose, that we'd use that one. That seems reasonable. So I'm going to go ahead and use that one. Um, I have a Mac, and so uh, I'd like it to work on both Windows and Mac. So I'm going to pick one of the more modern versions because they've got both x86 and ARM support. So I'm going to pick Ubuntu. Um, there, are, there are other features. So these are... This is pretty cool because this is all of the features and there's a ton of them. If you hit this button, you can go evaluate what it's doing. I don't think that we actually need anything in here. Um, oh, it's got, let's go see this. So I was going to use BATS, which is the Bash Automated Testing System. Um, I was actually going to use this. So... It does work on Debian, Ubuntu, and Alpine, so that's cool. Um, let's see. Wow, I have no idea what's wrong with GitHub today, but there definitely seems to be something wrong with it. So it's going to install bats from uh, Git checkout. It's going to modify some path. All right, yeah, I think we can... We can do this, but we'll need to we'll need to pin to a version. So let's go. Let's go back here, and we're going to say that we do want bats. Say okay. Configure options. So we want. We're not going to take the latest. We're going to manage that ourselves. So we're going to say one eight two. And so now we've got our dev container. So now I'm running locally. So you'll notice that this is asking me if I want to reopen it as a container. Um, I'll do that in a minute, but um, it's making sure that bash is our default profile. It's grabbing some, um, uh, I'm pretty sure I used to work with Mads. Um, it's grabbing some pieces and then it's going to it's going to get the feature cool so it looks like it has everything i need um to get started the docker file is all right that should be what we need so what we should be able to say is rebuild and reopen in a container. So let's see the log. Oh, I don't know. I don't think I've got... One second. Let me... I don't always start Docker Desktop um, because I don't always need it. So let me go ahead and start it. All right, up and running. Go ahead and get rid of that. And now we will do it again where we rebuild and reopen.
Also did an error. This is the best part of like a live stream is get to see that this actually sometimes is complicated. Um, no such image. This is one of the other kind of really frustrating things about the dev community, the dev container community right now is a lot of these seem to be unmanaged, which means that they often are broken. So Microsoft definitely changed a bunch of things about how it works. So that's deeply frustrating. Um, So what are we going to do? We're going to get rid of this. And we're going to use an image instead. We're going to use an image. And we're going to use... Uh, we're going to go back to dev container. We're going to go to the Ubuntu dev container. This is the same as the default universal Linux. Go to the template. I have no idea what, what's up with GitHub today, but it is not working. Um, we are going to... Let's see, image variant. All right. Let's go to dev container, dev JSON. There we go. Well, interesting. So according to it, oh, I think I know what it was. It was because it says 21, 2104 is not available, but 2204 is. So we'll change this to... Ubuntu, and then we'll change this to 2204, and then come after so that the JSON is legit. Now, if we rebuild and redo this, let's see if that works. That does, in fact, work. So this is the build that's happening right now. It's grabbing... Oh, something failed. Let's go see what failed. Docker credential. So this is, I think, because I'm running in... Um, I think this is because I'm running in 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 uh, WSL, and I I'm not sure why else it would be upset with me for Docker credentials. That is deeply frustrating so this is one of those like challenges of like um we're gonna do get diff here it should hopefully have saved everything so that we can do yeah everything is in here all right good so we're gonna do We're going to add dev container. We're going to add, let's see what's in NPM ignore. I didn't add that, but something did. Sure, we'll go ahead. That's fine. We can ignore those. And 
and then I do want that magic that it's doing to set up the IDE. We'll do git commit classic initial commit touch. We're going to do git push. Touch my security key, which is touch my Yuba key. Um, now let's go back. I mean, this is the whole point of like a dev environment remote is that something's broken locally with my Docker desktop. I have no idea why it won't let me run that. Um, but I don't care because I'm just going to run it in a cloud instead. So we're going to just launch it in Daytona. Um, oh. All right. I don't need any of these, so we'll go ahead and destroy this. Uh, I don't need this. But I don't need you either. Of course, this is configurable in Daytona if you were... Like a, if you're going to use it for a product, you would not necessarily hit that problem. But this is just a way for me not to overwhelm my tiny, tiny little demo cluster by forgetting to turn off instances. Um, so we'll let that run for a second. I'm interested to see if it works because clearly there's something, there's some challenge. But yeah, the dev container community is going to have to really i think kick up um it, uh, the game around the updating of content this is it's a, it's a challenge for everybody it's not just dev container it's anybody that uses containers because the docs fall out and then you start to you you read the docs but the docs never get updated so oh i can use 2104 no you can't 2104 doesn't exist anymore um and and that's that's really frustrating. I think it's a brand new, well, not brand new. It's a relatively new standard. And so you still run into these little um, challenges. So there are a handful of people watching. So if you haven't introduced yourself, just go ahead and drop a, drop a little thing into chat. We'll say hi. I'll probably just go for another half hour or so. But yeah, this the plan for this is that it's going to be a repeating series. It'll be on Tuesdays. Um, and I'll just beat my head against a wall until until we've made this better. Because um, I really like I, I like this as a format. I think it's it's when you use it, it's super easy. Once it exists, it's great. Um, getting it started, though, is is a challenge. And that you know, it was the same way with Dockerfile in the very beginning. Lots of people didn't know how to write Dockerfile. It got much better. Um, there's a lot of utilities now around helping that. So this will get better too. It's it's just a little painful right now. Um, let's see. So get that IDE up, and then we will go from there. So yeah. Thanks for dropping by on our inaugural uh, stream. I appreciate it. Hopefully this has been informative or fun. All right. There we go. We've got we've got it up and running, so I should be able to because we did ask for bats. So I do have bats. So I do have more or less everything that we need to now go start developing. Um, so let's go ahead and pop this out. We're gonna go get rid of all this junk, and we're gonna source this back up. I'll make this bigger for y'all. 
and let's go look about let's go read into bats First test. Setup. All right. So we'll do some. Oh, I could spell it right. That would help. So we've got source and test. So let's go in source. We're going to call this um, let's call it dev helper. I'm going to go grab one of the one of the things I've already done. So let's go to dev container features. Scripts. No, wrong script. Yes. All right, check for string. And we're gonna come back here, drop this in. All right. So I wanna test this now. So we've got a test. We can come over here. Let's read this again. Bats, we want to do a test bat. Let's see. Okay, so what we want to do is
this has been a long time. That feels like this is way more complicated than it used to be. Um, all right, let's go back. We're going to just steal some of this. So this is actually using this as a as a shell script that you're going to use. I want to I want to run it as a project. So we are going to We're going to go back here. New file. Desktop bats. Does it know that this is... Actually, is there an extension for bats? There is. Oh, very cool. So, let's see what you do. Syntax highlighting, code snippets. Looks like it does. Very cool. So it has snippets for some of them. <laughs> Syntax highlighting for all of it. Cool. Um, so how would we go about installing this? We're going to hit install. Um, copy extension ID. Then we're going to go back to dev container. And we are going to... <laughs> now I'm not going to read... <laughs> Excuse me, I'm not going to rebuild this because I already have it installed. I don't need to do it. But I, the next time, I want this to definitely happen. So um, let's go here. Get, get diff. Uh, that's right. Get status. All right, so we're going to get add... Get commit... Adding the bats extension. Cool. Oh, doesn't know who I am. That's interesting. Should know who I am. So we've got that now. Um, we are going to now. Let's see, we've got that. We've got this. Oops. We want to. This is a long stream just to get to the fact, the point where we start to write helpers. So we probably don't want it organized like this, but I just want something to be here and then, um, and then we'll figure it out. Uh, we'll make it, we'll make it better right now. Not so much, but we all, we will make it, we will make it better at some point. So, um, 
I want to test this because I feel like we don't do testing from the beginning. We just won't do testing. So that's core. So we know we've got bats core. Let's see what else we want. Support. All right, some of those, some helpers. Files. Yeah, this is, this is very much what we want. Okay, so. We're going to say this. We're going to say file load. I think that's, yep. Cool. All right. So there are no executables in that directory, but we do want to do source dev helper dot shell. So let's see if this works. So if we go back here bats we're gonna say hmm. okay so i've got bats. so let's just bats what are we doing here? Count. Let's go back to installation. I hate submodules. I really don't want to do submodules. Uh, but it looks like that's that's where we're at. So I will see if I can find a different way to do this than submodules in the future. But for now, for now, we are gonna just suck it up and and do this. Um, I need file.git and it's going to come out to be test, test helper, bats. All right. Okay, let's see if this... You know, best test, just test, that's... Insert 
parameter not set. What's not set? All right. Let's see. One second. So if I just take this out, so this should. Oh, wait, I need to do. That's this directory. So if I do bash back, that, that. So if I do directory, that's the directory I'm in right now. From here, we're going to go back and then source dev helper. That should. <clears throat> All right, so we found dev helper. So we're going to say source, which we basically, I just don't want to keep redoing this. So we're going to do source is your source. Okay. So instead of this, we're going to say source and we're going to get rid of all of that. So that should go there. And now this should work. So we should go to, yes. All right, great. Perfect. So, um, we are going to So I can unminimize to get the cool. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about with like dev container has sharp corners. I just want the man pages. But I'm going to have to unminimize it to get the man pages. It's it's so so painful sometimes. Um, let's do sudo app get update. Oh, frustrating. Of course. Like. This is one of those silly things where, like, this doesn't even really matter. All I want is the man pages. It's a pretty common thing where you really have to think about what you need to develop and make sure that that's in the dev container 
um, or it gets added. So this would be a good this would be a good one for a feature where you would build a feature to make sure that you unminimize, you fix this unminimize nonsense, and that it does take time though, and that's that's really the problem is that some of these things, if you do like pre builds, they can go faster, and I think you know that will all get better over time. But the goal here is to be as fast as possible. And so you're making a trade between putting more stuff into a container and making that container bigger, which takes longer to pull, or to update things on the fly as that container is getting built. And so, you know, I think these are all trade-offs that you have to make. I think that the trade you should make is faster boot times and potentially having to install things when the user is there. This is frustrating, but a 20 minute boot time is going to be worse than this. So, um, but, but partly also what needs to happen is this content needs, needs to be taken care of and updated. So it's just a good example of where you'll probably, if you go, if your company goes into dev container, you will certainly build your own dev containers and then you will want to put a CI process around that to make sure that they're built, they're pre-built, they're updated, um, and then potentially your docs are updated because these docs, they're just not. And uh, the scripts aren't updated and everything breaks and it's super painful right now. But that's the way it, it's the way it is with, with nascent communities and we can all make it better. Um, I probably should be taking a list of all the things that are breaking and filing issues back against those communities to try to fix them. So I'll put that in my list of things to do is to go submit bugs for at least this unminimize. Um, I have no idea if Microsoft will take it or not, but you know, at least we'll we'll put it out there. So I just want to test this, and then we're going to call it. We're going to call it for the day. Um, all right, so I want to create a directory. So I'm going to do um, uh, test dir equals. Make dir, no, not make dir, make temp directory. So we'll do that. So if we do this just to test it, all right, then we get a temp directory. Now we're gonna do RM, RF, make uh, RM, RF, temp, temp, perfect. Okay, great, that's what we want. <clears throat> so we actually need, now we need tear down and we need to rm rf tester so we are going to do um developer check file for string we're gonna check for foo inside of the tester tester test <clears throat> and we're gonna do that so then we're gonna do assert 
file. Oops. Interesting. So let's go bats. We're going to go to bats file. We're going to assert. The file exists. And a file contains. All right. Oh, perfect. Look at that. We have, we actually have something that will do this for us where we don't have to. Perfect. All right, so we're going to take this. Put this in here. Now we're just going to call it tester. I'm not going to call it test tester. That's silly. All right. We're going to chest that, and we're going to look for boo. All right, here we go. Let's see if this works. Oh, did that actually... Um, we're just gonna, just for fun, we are going to, we're just gonna cat this just to see if this actually worked. Interesting. So it captured all of the input. So is there a way in bats? Actually, I know what we can do. We're going to say bar. So this should fail. It does. And if we change this back to foo, then it should succeed. Awesome. Well, that's it. So there we have it. We have the first, the first of many tests that we need to write. So. Um, this has been about an hour and 40 minutes. It's probably enough. Everyone's probably had a good time. Um, 
we will build more, but this is the beginning of a library that will help make dev container, writing dev container and dev container features and dev container templates a lot easier, hopefully. Um, this isn't an attempt to like redo Ansible or Chef or Puppet. That's way beyond the scope of what I'm trying to accomplish. There's probably ways to use those tools here that would be smarter, but um, I don't really, that feels like also overkill. So we're trying to balance, you know, bringing a sledgehammer when just a framing hammer would too. Um, so join us next week, next Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific, and we will, um, we'll do some more. Um, in the meanwhile, if you're interested, head to Daytona, oops, head to www.daytona.io and uh, check us out. Enter your email address if you're interested in more information. We'll be launching, we launched publicly just recently, last week actually, um, and we will be putting out our single host uh, capacity to test Daytona. So you'll be able to run it in your own environments. Um, you know, we have lots of we have lots of folks that look at things like code spaces and say that's awesome, but it's a SaaS. It runs in Microsoft's environment. I use GitHub Enterprise. That's not going to work for me. And Daytona is built for you. You can run it in your environment. You can run it in AWS or Google or Azure, wherever you want. Uh, attach it to your GitHub Enterprise or whatever uh, GitLab. And then you should be able to get the same power and flexibility and autom automation, but just in your own environment. So, you know, against your own data sources, against your own uh, debt, you know, uh, let's see, your own JFrog Artifactory, your own GitHub Enterprise, um, in your own data center where your staging environments are. That way, it should just make everything easier. Plus, your company is going to like it because it makes things more secure. Uh, and you're going to like it because you're going to get likely a larger instance that's closer to what you need um, and... Uh, you know, is actually at data center rates, but it's going to feel local. So if you have any questions, just you can ping me. Uh, you can find me. Um, you can find me on uh, the internet. So typically, like if you go to uh, Twitch uh, or if you go to Twitter, <coughs> I'm almost always Metcalf C. So. <coughs> And if you want to talk to me uh, by email, you can find me pretty easily. I'm just chat at Daytona. So let me toss this in here and you can find me chat at Daytona. So I'm going to go ahead and end the stream for today. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'll see you next week.